our first case to come before us is um, <clears throat> State of Ohio versus Kirby, and I'm getting confused because Appley, I thought you I did, I did. You just wanted to be here. I didn't realize that they hadn't done it with just wanted to hang out. I go back and back if you want. <laughs> You're fine. I just got a little confused. Okay, so you have 15 minutes. I appreciate your honor. I can just reserve four minutes for a rebuttal. That'd be, I'd appreciate that. Well, she's not going to argue. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> See, you can use them too. I know, I can go sit down. Fall apart. That's all right. You're fine. But, your honor, for Mr. Kirkby, attorney Greg Price, uh, today there's four issues before the court. If I could, I'd like to focus on one, two, and four. And, and I think that runs in chronological order, your honor. The, the first issue before the court is an issue of compulsory process. Um, in this case, it, it's it's kind of fact sensitive whenever you're dealing with this issue, but what the court really needs to focus on is that this was a meth case. This is a meth case that involved a house that Mr. Kirkby owned. The testimony at trial showed that Mr. Kirkby was in jail, was incarcerated on another charge that's part of this appeal, but we're not really bringing any issues with that. He had been incarcerated for stealing batteries out of uh, utility poles, which I didn't even know was possible, but apparently he did several times. During that time, there were two women living in his house. The police raided that house. Police found a meth lab in the basement. Wasn't that contested, though, as to whether both of the women were living in the house? Yes. And, and, and I think the key part of this, Your Honors, and if I can, I hate to flip through papers while I'm doing this, but if you look to the transcript of page 293, um, the officers took the stand, and the two witnesses in question are, are Jessica and Heather. Jessica and Heather were both known meth users, both known meth manufacturers. Whenever uh, Officer Simcox took the stand, he said, in fact, whenever he searched that house and he found that meth lab, his initial impression was that Heather and Jessica were cooking that meth lab. Not that Mr. Kirkby was doing it. Even though they're in Mr. Kirkby's house, Simcox said, I think Jessica and Heather are doing this. Now, based on that, Prior to this trial, both Heather and Jessica had been subpoenaed. They had been subpoenaed by defense counsel, even though defense counsel had not been able to talk to them. He had not been able to talk to them because he could not locate them. Whenever Simcox was testifying, he said he's very familiar with those two people, he knows their history, he's worked with them before, had them arrested, and they've been prosecuted before. So whenever it came to trial day, and Heather and Jessica did not show up, the court issued uh, bench warrants for both of them. Jessica actually arrived the next day and said, I didn't know it was a series. I apologize, Your Honor. Please, I'll testify. Heather, on the other hand, contacted the court and said that she will not be appearing. Based on that, defense counsel asked for a continuance so that the sheriff could actually go pick her up and bring her back to the court. The court denied that continuance because the court basically, well, we don't know what the court did because the court didn't have a hearing on that. Do we know where she was? The only information in the record, Your Honor, is that she called the court, she got the subpoena, she got the notice to she be says, there. She says, I ain't going to be there. I am not going to come. So that's when, and whenever the court gave defense counsel that information, defense counsel said, well, I'm going to need a continuance so the sheriff can go get her. And the court didn't have a hearing on the matter. The court just said, I'm going to deny it. And but, but, but could the sheriff have found her? I think if the court can talk to her on the phone, they, they, the sheriff can okay. go find her. And also... Whenever, you're, whenever I spoke about the facts of this case, you also have an officer saying, I know her, I've worked with her, I've arrested her, I've prosecuted her. Whenever I walked in this house, I thought that was hers. You have several officers taking the stand and testifying to the fact that they know her, and they've known her for a while. So I think the argument that, well, we couldn't have ever found her, it is pretty much rebuffed by this, those facts. But once again, there's not a hearing specific to this continuance saying that, so you really get a parse through this transcript to get this information out. But Well, let me ask you this. I think I understand your point with that, but we deal with error all the time. We have to know that it's prejudicial error. Was there anything that was proffered as to why Heather would have been able to testify to? And I'm not sure there was, was there? there? There wasn't. But once again, there wasn't a hearing on the matter. There wasn't anything proffered. And I know that the jurisprudence is, you know what, it has to be presidential. This has to be someone that's in favor of your case. You just can't randomly subpoena anybody. But once again, whenever you have compulsory process, part of that is to say, look, I need you to even show up. 
I can't find you. I don't know where you are. Court, can you help me out? And the court already had testimony. These officers know exactly where she is, who she is, what she looks like, who she ain't around. But that's what I'm. But that's what I'm getting at because that is true. The the trial court, I would think, wouldn't want that reputation because what the heck? I'm not going to worry about it. I issued a bench warrant. I'm not going to have it served. I'm not going to have you picked up. So, but if the trial court wants to run its court that way, that way, that's its choice. But how has that prejudiced your client in this case? And, and I would disagree with you. Okay. I, I would say that the trial court doesn't have the option to run it that way. Whenever you have compulsory process, the entire purpose is, look, I subpoenaed them. They have the information. They said they're not going to show up. The compulsory part is then the court's responsibility. It's not a question of whether or not they want to or not. Now, how long do you, how long do you wait for that compulsory part? Right. That's the real question in, in our opinion. But on top of that, though, but it still goes back, and I, I agree you're raising a very good point, but I guess my point is still... How do we as a, so you're arguing, I guess, what I'm trying to say, I'm sorry, I'm thinking as I'm talking, <laughs> so it's dangerous, but I guess what you're really arguing is it's just prejudicial per se. I, I almost say that to, the, to this degree. If you, if you have this compulsory process issue, you do not have a hearing, you do not take any proper testimony, and you do not do anything other than say, I'm not going to give you a continuance. I think these facts almost rep represent a per se violation of that. Because if you have compulsory, you don't even know you need the compulsory part of it until the person doesn't show up. So the person didn't show up on, let's say it was a Wednesday, and I'm sorry, I don't know what day it was. But then the next day we come back and we have information that she called the court and said she's not coming. Well, that's the part where the compulsory part kicks in, and the court has to send out the sheriff to get them. Now, if we come back to what Judge Schaefer was kind of nodding her head to, if it's five days later and we can't find her, well then... We're just stuck. I'm sorry, we can't hold this trial up forever. But if it hasn't even been an hour, and you have testimony from officers saying, I know who she is, I can probably go get her right now. Well then, I don't know what the problem with adding this continuance is. And I know that your traditional standard is going to be an abuse of discretion standard, and I, I really do have a problem with that in this circumstance. I don't have a problem with that if somebody calls in and says, I have the flu, my client's running late, one of my witnesses is going to be an hour late. That's totally separate from something like this. Whenever you have something, compulsory process is one of the absolute mandatory constitutional rights that you have as a defendant. We can't even let you plead guilty unless you know that. But I guess where I get a little confused with your argument is your, your assignment of error is that the trial court erred in not granting a continuance. Correct. Not, and not issuing a warrant for their arrest or you know, going out looking for them. And I, and I think what another kind of glitch in the facts here is that the trial court was aware of this fact. The trial court did put out a bench warrant, but whenever it came to the fact that the person called the court and said, look, I'm not coming, the trial court didn't take the next step, which is to send the sheriff out and get that's the know, problem. Did the court know where this person was? I don't, I, I can't tell you because there wasn't a hearing, but, but there was a, a out of hearing of the jury, on the record, counselor called and said, and, she called and said, look, and how, I'm not. how long was the continuance that was asked for? One day was what they were given so far. But whenever, but whenever she said, I'm not coming, I think they were just going to ask for the sheriff to go get her. And once again, going back to Judge Schaefer, if it's two days, we come back in and see where we are. But at that point, the sheriff picks them up, puts them in the jail, and they're going to be there. But just for time's sake, if, if we can move That's on. That's fine. And the, the, the next issue, Your Honors, I think we're going to have to deal with um, assignment of error two. Assignment of error two, it, it's, it's brief because I think it's very clear that we lose, but I think the court has to address this issue. In assignment of error two, a jury, a juror comes to the court and says, "Look, there's there's real problems." One juror in the in the jury pool, in the jury room actually went and did independent research on what the word accomplice means, um, it, and she said it actually swayed her opinion as to whether this person is guilty or not. Now. The real question is here, whenever you go to Rule 606 and you deal with the competency of a juror to testify, even if this juror comes up and says, look, I absolutely broke the rules. I absolutely did something wrong. This is what I did. The court can't take that statement and use it to say whether or not there should be a mistrial. 
606B says a juror can never testify about whether how they came to the guilty or not guilty plea. That makes total sense. You don't want people coming in and harassing jurors afterwards. But the second half of 606B actually says, if a juror comes in and says, look, there is something absolutely wrong going on in this jury room. We have to do something about it. The courtroom cannot do anything about it unless there is outside information to substantiate that. So in this case, whenever you say a juror comes to you and says, look, somebody in there is looking up words, they're using definitions they're not supposed to be, and that's the reason they found this person guilty, you can do nothing with that unless there's some kind of outside information or outside evidence that would allow you to question that. And in this circumstance, I don't think there's any way humanly possible to have any kind of outside information that would allow you to question that. Well, why wouldn't the computer search be outside information? Well, at that point, then you got to subpoena their computer, you got to subpoena this, you got to subpoena that. you got to figure out what computer they were at. And really, can you even call a juror? You would have to subpoena the juror to get them on the stand to question them. And even then, 606B says you can't use any of that information. you got to then go get the computer and do the search. And whenever you're dealing with a case like this with a person that has appointed counsel, what's the likelihood that that's going to happen? Not very. So whenever you get to that point and you say, and even if you take this to another step, Your Honor, even if you have a person that was in the jury room saying, look, I know what the word accomplice means, this is what the word accomplice means, and here's where I found it, and everybody used to use this definition. So it wasn't in the jury instructions? It was in the jury instructions, yes. But then they're saying, look, that didn't make sense. I went and got another one. Everybody used this. So if you just have a simple person in there saying, that's not what this word means, this is what we should be doing, there's absolutely no outside information that would be admissible at that point. You would simply have a runaway jury based on this one juror's definition. And there's absolutely nothing you can do about it under 606B. And for that, just under due process reasons, we're saying that's unconstitutional. That's the application the court is willing to take here today. And under, and under um, assignment of error four, Your Honor, the merger issue, um, Mr. Kirkby was charged with both possession of chemicals and manufacturing. We're saying those two things have to merge. With this needs to be remanded. The, jury, the state needs to pick one of these and he just needs to get resentenced. I think it's very clear that whenever somebody comes to your basement and finds all kinds of chemicals that can be used for manufacturing methamphetamine and finds methamphetamine, that those two things are going to be in the same animus. The only reason he had those chemicals was to make the meth that was right next to the chemicals. The only reason he made the meth was because he had the chemicals. The two things are so closely tied, there's absolutely no way that you can move the so for that reason, we'd ask the matter be remanded and that the state elect him sentence on one of those and then he'd be resentenced. Even if the facts were that he had a basement full of cooking materials and didn't use them on the same day, waited a couple weeks, and then went back and made it? Even if he went back several days, several weeks, several months, if he'd used this exact same chemicals to make this exact same end product and he did it over and over and over, Yes, they have to merge. Now, can he be convicted of several counts of manufacturing? So in your scenario, if he made it once, used the same chemicals, made it twice, made it three well, times? Yeah, he, does it, he, he buys it and puts it all down in his basement, doesn't do anything to use it yet. And he comes back days, weeks, I don't care. And then he makes it. I would say, no, it's the same situation. What if you purchased Sudafed eight times over the previous couple, three months and manufactured over a couple, three months' time? Aren't you, aren't you acquiring, possessing stuff over time to be able to manufacture over time? So in that case, how would they merge? In, in your situation, I, I think whenever you start connecting, whenever you start collecting these ingredients and make the product, those two things have to merge. Now, if you start collecting ingredients and make the product again, those two things have to merge as well. But you can still have two counts. And I think that's where Your Honor would go with that. If you were continuously making meth and continuously getting the materials, then you just have to group those things together. So you can have three counts of manufacturing, but you can't have three counts of manufacturing and three counts of possession. It just doesn't work. Because the second he starts getting that Sudafed to make this product and he gets to the manufacturing step, those things have to merge. Now, if he gets eight packs of Sudafed, gets bleach or whatever they use, and doesn't quite get to the manufacturing part, then he has possession. But the second he starts manufacturing with all those things, they have to merge. 
So in your example, if he then starts getting Sudafed again, then he can get charged with possession until he starts manufacturing that again. What if he's missing an ingredient? Guy will get another one. This doesn't have enough to manufacture. Now he's missing the Sudafed. A guy will get some more Sudafed. I don't have enough here to make anything. I got everything else but the Sudafed. Now I got to go get some more of that. Now what is he? He has possession. He has possession of those chemicals. So if he doesn't have the ability to make the meth, he can't be charged with manufacturing. But if he brings back the Sudafed, he still has possession until he starts putting it all together and getting the manufacturing. And you're out of time. I kind of figured it out. Thank you, Honors. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, for your presentation, and thank you to the prosecutor's office for being here, too. You both will receive um, the uh, finished product in the mail, our written opinion, and you can look online on the Supreme Court website and on our website. Thank you so much. Thank you, Honors.